All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we're gonna to be talking more about the Dirac spinner quantized field, right? So let's, before we get into this, uh, just as a recap, we've talked about, we've introduced the Dirac equation, we've built it sort of from the Klein-Gordon equation because we've uh, realized and understood from previous videos that the Dirac equation behaves similarly to the Klein-Gordon equation. It's an oscillatory equation. Uh, it encompasses all the equations of motion that we need in order to describe uh, objects that have spin, right? So we've introduced spinners, we've introduced the idea of quantized Dirac equation. Now let's get in, or the quantized Dirac fields. Now let's get, what I wanna do in here is get a little bit more into the subscripts and all the nuances here because we want to really understand what each and every uh, function or variable physically represents here because we're talking physics right and it can be really easy to get in the weeds here so let's get right into this but before we get into this uh make sure to hit, hit that like and subscribe button and let's get right into it so when we're getting into the uh the spinner these spinner fields what we want to do is again just recall a few things so the first thing that we want to recall okay so this is this here is our proposed field right this thing works um as a oscillatory function or as an oscillatory solution to our Dirac equation okay and we've introduced these guys here, which are creation and annihilation variables. We've introduced these guys here, again, creation and annihilation, but for the anti-spinners, so for anti-particles, right? So we have uh, creation and annihilation for particles and creation and annihilation for anti-particles. Then we have these guys here, and we're gonna get into exactly what happens when we when we make this complex, right? So initially we had this guy, and we said if we want to make our fields complex, then we have this guy right here. Okay, let's parse everything out now, and take a look at which what everything what these R's uh, spin over or sum over, uh, or why we have them in here and in here, and. We're, we, we really just want to familiarize ourselves, maybe be a little bit repetitive here, uh, just to really, really understand exactly what these spinner fields look like and what everything in these uh, equations tell us. Because again, I'm here to teach us more about the math or to talk more about the math behind the physics, not just talk about the physics. So we, so I, like I mentioned, we have creation and annihilation operators. So the R, in these equations, these guys here, these R's, these are referring to, again, the spin states, right? So we're, uh, our integral is over momentum states. That's the K. Our sum is over our spin states. My apologies for the dog. And, again, my apologies for the dog. So we have, so the R's here, so we're sp if R is 1, Right, we have spin up particle, if R is two, we have spin down particle, okay? One, spin up, two, spin down, and then we have these daggers, right? So one and two, without the daggers, it's going to be associated with annihilation, and with the daggers, it's gonna be associated with the creation, right? So if we have C1 dagger, that's creation of a spin up particle because the dagger again tells us creation, the one tells us spin up, right? So that's that. And the, the same thing goes for these Ds, but we're just talking about antiparticles in this case, right? Rs again spin up and spin down, right? It, 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 these are really just labels. You could, if you want to, associate two with spin down and one with spin up. This is just the mathematical statement saying that we, we want to take into account both. We're, spin, we're summing over both states, okay? I want to recall a little bit back in chapter five that we had these guys here and these guys, right? So these were the vial spinners and they are used to make up the Dirac spinner. 
where the vial spinners look like this, right? So we have one and two, again, referring to up and down. Uh, and so you can um, see here that the, so the difference here, so we have up and down, and then this E to the IMT, E to the negative IMT, these uh, are the same, right? So really, again, R, or one and two refer to just up and down uh, orthogonal states, right? These are orthogonal. And again, taking into account that the each element in these vectors, in these small little vectors, are not space-time dependent, right? So what that means is that um, these things, wherever you are in space, these things don't depend on that, right? If you have some field, the values of whatever entries are in here are not dependent on where that where you are in that field, where the particle is in that field. These are these really describe the spin of the particle, and the spin of the particle does not depend on where the particle is, okay? And at any moment in time either. So again, these things are not the they're not they're not space time dependent. Same thing here. Our uh, we have another solution to our Dirac equation, which looks like this, where we again we have one and two referring to spin up and spin down, but this is just the complex, these are just complex versions of the U's, right? So these V's are just complex version of the U's where we have these guys here. We can think of the, one, the U's and the V's as being these things that take into account the mass of the particle as well, right? So if we're taking into account the spin, we also want to take into account the mass. This, that's where this M is coming from, right? It can also just be thought of as a constant. If you really just want to think about this in terms of mathematics, um, that's where these come from, right? So that is all of that. I have another page here. This is somewhat of a long, uh, maybe not a long video, but a couple of pages here. Because I'm putting, I, I really want to put everything in English. Right, so we can actually understand what everything is saying in these equations. So if we have, for example, C1, U1, okay, this is, so we have annihilation because there's no dagger. One is referring to spin up, right? And then U is, um, U1, this is a solution, right? We also had those left and right cover spinners. That was... Um, so if we go back really quick, that was, again, the U here, oops, this U here, right? So, because you could ask, well, what really is the difference between U and V? Math so the, ma the mathematical difference, again, is this negative, but what, what about the physical aspect, right? You could say, you, what we're doing, what, essentially what we're doing is we are trying to generalize as much as we can mathematically. And then we're going to try to put labels on what all that math means, right? And so we have these U's, and these U's, uh, they take, each U takes into account a spin up and spin down. But once you imply uh, complexity to these solutions, again, these are solutions to the Dirac equation, then you have to think, okay, what is what is the added um com what's the added level of complexity that's being um th th that's sort of being added into the physics here the, the actual physics and the, the that is right and left chiral spinners so we talked about that in an, er an earlier video where chirality was really so was something of interest they uh Chirality played a role in vial spinners, right? So, uh, the these and these essentially are the vial spinners, right? The U and the Vs. Okay, so U's are going to refer. If we go back, U here and U here is going to refer to the left chiral spinners, and then U daggers are going to refer to right chiral spinners, right? V daggers, or Vs are going to be refer, referred again to the right chiral anti-spinners, 
right? These are the solutions. Again, the V's and the U's are the solutions, right? So we're calling those the spinners, okay? And you can have anti-spinner and you can have spinners. You can have left chiral anti-spinners and you can have right chiral anti-spinners and so forth. That's all of this. So, okay, so I started going into this one. So CU, U2, so annihilation of spin down. So that's that sort of takes this guy into account left chiral spinner right, so that's this guy again my apologies for the dog barking and we can follow this right so c dagger creation uh one spin up u right chiral spinner or u dagger right chiral spinner right c2 or c dagger creation two uh spin down u dagger right chiral uh, spinner, and we can just continue doing. You can you could pause the video if you want to really digest this. The idea here is that we are just parsing out what everything means in this equation, because these this equ this equation is very complex, and I think going over this once, twice, maybe three times, um, is is useful, especially if this is kind of if this is the kind of thing that you're really interested in, and really interested in understanding. So. Taking a bird's eye view now, we talked about, uh, so what have we talked about so far? We've talked about the spin, we've talked about scalar fields, and we've talked about um, complex scalar fields. What we did there is that we said, okay, we had sp uh, scalar fields, right? Scalar fields were the most simple. They applied to the Klein-Gordon equation and the Klein-Gordon equation uh, was sort of, it was oscillatory in nature. And the solutions, we said, were operators. And the operators um, were associated with acting on fields that gave rise to particles. When we talked about scalar fields, we talked about creating and annihilating um, particles and antiparticles. That's why we needed that complexity, right? So we had we had these solutions. Right? So we had these solutions. This was a solution. This was also a solution. This was creation of a field for complex scalars. This was annihilation of an annihilation field for complex scalars. And now we have these guys, right? So we have this guy and this guy. Again, we're sort of say, taking a step back. We're comparing these to these. And this guy was associated with left, is now associated with left chiral fields for complex spinners. And this guy is associated with right chiral spinners for complex spinners. Because, again, when we go back to our equation here, when we made this complex, Right, we added complexity to our vial spinners. And when you add that complexity to the vial spinners, like we saw here, um, adding, the, adding this complexity adds chirality. Right? So we needed two different types of chiral particles. Sort of last but not least, right, so dagger on the operator, creation annihilation, dagger on the solution, uh, left chiral, anti chiral, or right chiral, right? So that is what, um, so if you have, it's a difference between this dagger and this dagger, right? So that is also something uh, you could put in the back of your mind also. I have a little bit of a pictorial representation here, uh, maybe to understand visually. I don't really like understanding visually uh, advanced physics concepts because it really, um, there has to be that there, in my view at least, there is a point at which the um, the visualizations can only get you so far. Uh, but if you if you even dare to attempt to visualize what this kind of stuff might look like, a left chiral spinner field might be a field that has some sort of orientation in space. Um, that. And then a right chiral one just has the opposite orientation, right? So, again, take this with a grain of salt. I don't, again, I don't really like, um, I, I wouldn't say I don't like, I tend not to visualize p 
pictorially what these solutions mean because I think our our um, visualization capacities are limited, right? I, I think we can abstract better than we can visualize. And so with that being said, I'm pushing here on 15 minutes, which is typically what I usually do for videos here. So, um, so I'm going to call it there. If you guys, again, like this type of content, please hit that subscribe button and hit that like button. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.